Japana, Yuka House of Japan Outpost. Today we are in Liverpool again. Uh, this hotel over there is called Adelphi Hotel. So let's find out what is so special about Adelphi Hotel. Steve Smith. So, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, you have this book here. Um, would you tell me about this book? Yes, this is a book that I was asked to write uh, by the family of Mr. James Lord Bowes of Liverpool, who in the 19th century was the first ever appointed Japanese consul in the United Kingdom. Um, he's largely forgotten now in Liverpool, but in fact he had a, a great deal of impact on both the business community and the cultural community of this city at a time when uh, culture was very, very important uh, to just about everybody. Um, he actually constructed the first ever museum of Japanese art in the Western world at the rear of his own house, uh, which still exists. And um, one of the things that uh, links the book to where we are today is the fact that this is the site of a visit the 1872 Japanese Embassy to the United Kingdom and he attended that banquet here. Um, we know this and uh, in actual fact it was one of the beginning points of the Meiji export drive and uh, he took quite a part in that. So that's why I wrote the book. Yes, thank you so much. So, Steve, uh, will you tell me uh, where this place is? This is, uh, or was, originally called Stretland Cottage. And it was the first house personally owned by James Lord when he really made it as a businessman. In his quite young 30s, he bought the house rather than had it built. We're now pretty sure of that. Um, but he modified it to his own purposes and he stayed here until 1872. Uh, this was his first home when he married Charlotte uh, Vickery, uh, who then became Charlotte Vickery Bowes. Uh, and they lived here very happily, but it wasn't really quite large enough for them. So he commissioned a new house almost in the city itself and moved to there in 1872. Mm. So back then, this was like a um, uh, farming area or what was it? It was, it was a very small village. Um, the village itself had been simply a farming area for a very long time. And slowly but surely, uh, a number of rich businessmen decided to come out here and build their own house in the peace and quiet of what was then the countryside. Oh. So back then it was like uh, living in that country. It was indeed, ah, yes. I see. Yes. Okay, well thank you so much. Okay. Well, by George Audley and his brother William for James Bowes when he finally made it as a multi-millionaire businessman in Liverpool. Um, the, the tower is of course named Stretlam as Stretlam Cottage was named before it uh, because of a suspected family connection to the Durham area. Uh, the house was occupied from 1872 to 1900 after that, unfortunately, the house had to be sold because James died in 1899. It was sold for £10,000 in that year, which would today be worth £1 million. Mm. So this was the house after the, the cottage? Yes, this was the house that he moved to after leaving Stretland Cottage in Beaconsfield Road. So, this is the 
tower that it refers to. As you can see, it's, it's modelled on a Highland design, uh, what's generally called Scottish Gothic. So he uh, made a museum right behind this? He did. He installed a private museum first behind the house, which occupied pretty much all of the rear land at the, where the garden used to be. And the museum was open to the public in order to raise funds for the church and orphanage charities that he supported in Liverpool. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. So, Stephen, what, what is this entrance? This is the entrance to the museum that the public used in 1890. It was built specially for the museum houses. The house itself was built in 1872. This was added purely so the public would gain access to the museum without going through the house. Very interesting. Now it looks rather bad. It does look a little bit run down. So, Steve, would you tell me what this building is? This is the original museum of Japanese art built by James Bowes in 1890 to house his collection. Um, but not just to house his collection, his collection was on open display to the public and he charged one shilling admission, which is 5p a day. And uh, the second time that he opened it to the public, 20,000 visitors arrived and all of the proceeds went to local church charities and to his orphanage charities which he supported in Liverpool. Um, uh, this is the main gallery from here to this end and at one time there was a picture gallery which extended in this direction uh, which extended I mean, from it. So this was right behind his house then? Right behind his house. Wow. This in was, his backyard. <laughs> uh, yes, he actually destroyed his garden in order oh, to build Oh, really? His... Ah, I see. I often wonder whether his wife approved. <laughs> I doubt it. Anyway, so the building is original. The building is completely original. Original. And then now, what, what is it? Is it it's, a... it's now a church. Church. And has oh. been for several years. Oh, okay, I see. Hi, so, would you tell me, uh, what's this uh, tombstone? These, these stones are the family oh. tombstones. Was that a spirit? I don't, yeah. I don't know. <coughs> these are the family tombstones of the Bowes family. Um, we begin here with his mother, Elizabeth. And the final entry is in 1967, when uh, James's eldest daughter died. She still lived in Liverpool at that stage. Mm -hmm. uh, she lived not a mile from here. Um, and uh, that one is? This one is James's own grave, uh, also his wife, and his mother-in-law, strangely enough. Um, apparently he got on very well with his mother-in-law, Mary Charlotte Adam. Uh, she died literally one year before he did. Oh, one year before he did. Uh... Is that the vandalism that the... Is it is, I'm afraid it is vandalism, yes. Um, oh. It was reported to uh, the City Council that they don't feel that it's anything to do with them. Oh, I see. If you, if you actually put the name in, you find a website for the picture. Because yes. there's a database. Yes. I don't know if you did it, but somebody did a yes. database. Would you tell me what you think about uh, why James Powell got so interested in Japanese arts and crafts? Initially he was introduced to uh, Japanese art at the 1867 Paris Expo. Paris Expo, yeah. Uh, where he was taken by George Audsley. I believe they travelled together. And, uh, I, as I understand it, 
his connection to Japanese art from that point was purely emotional. Emotional. Um, something actually clicked in him, in his, in his sense of taste, that made him want to see more of it, and he did. So he collected it. I understand that he was a very quiet gentleman. As I understand yeah. it, yes, he was. He had yeah. a reputation for being very kind yeah. to people. Um, and his, his whole family actually did that. Mm, I wondered, he, he was more like a Japanese a bit, you know, quiet, he, uh, reserved. He was very reserved, yeah. and uh, I think that is perhaps why he got on very well mm. with his Japanese friends. Mm. He had a number of friends, both in Japan and in the Japanese legation in London, mm. and they all spoke very highly of him. I see. Okay. So then, um, could you tell me what you what you think that James Bond's contribution is to Japanese people, to English people back then? His main contribution was to make uh, each side, Japanese and English, understandable to the other. Mm. Uh, he almost stood as an interpreter between the two and tried to explain the values of each part of the world to the other part of the world. Uh, in that, he, I think he was very successful. He exposed uh, the British public to his collection and made them understand Japanese culture through that. And he explained the details of Japanese culture in ways that other people had never bothered to even find out. Most of the general public was quite um, ignorant of Japanese culture yes. back then. So he brought in all the high quality craft and art. He did, and uh, he wrote several books which explained in detail what exactly the art comprised of, how it was made, who was making it, and why in fact it was made the way that it was. Uh, none of these things had really been addressed by very many people before then. And, uh, when he wrote the books, I think he wrote them to establish facts for himself, but he soon realized that they could be used as an educational force to the general public. Mm. So thanks to him, maybe uh, British people know about Japan <laughs> well, as they are now. He formed the foundations for a great deal of what came later. Without his preparatory work, a lot of students and academics in later years would not have been uh, able to find their start in the subject and they certainly wouldn't have had anything to build upon. I see. Thank you very much. You're